we're back with just Steven and me. You're a fool, Danny, and you will lose everything. I don't think I'm going to lose everything. It was foolish of you to come here tonight, Danny. The Aurors are already on their way. I can leave and you can do the whole episode by yourself. You're supposed to say, by which time I will be gone and you will be dead. Do you, did you even watch the movie? I'm not going to wish death upon you. Well, you're not committed enough to this podcast. Um, we friends are discussing Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, a movie released in 2007, directed by David Yates. Uh, screenplay, not by your boy Steve Cloves, but by Michael Goldenberg. Uh, cinematography by, and oh, good Lord, I'm sorry to all of our Eastern European listeners, Slavomir Idziak is the closest I'm going to get to that name. This movie, Danny, um, do you want to guess where it ranked on the um, list of highest grossing movies in 2007? I don't even know what else came out in 2007. Well, that's part of the game. Do you want to guess where this one ranked? Top five. Okay, well, no shit. You want to <laughs> you want to give a specific number here? Um, let's go with the second spot. Very good. Do you know what the number one movie in terms of highest grossing uh, revenue numbers in 2007 was? I can't think of what else came out in 2007. Yeah, it was um, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End was the highest grossing movie of 2007. Another film franchise that I um, love very, very much, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Danny, what were your overall thoughts about this movie having just consumed it? I liked it more than I remembered. My problem with this movie previously was I did not like it. I did not like the book to movie translation. And there's a certain sequence of events that causes that dislike for me. But I actually enjoyed watching it again. Do like it a lot more. Might be one of my favorites so far that we've watched in the rewatch. Like most enjoyable to rewatch. What were your... My thoughts about this movie, I think this is my favorite movie so far by a long shot. I think the only, I think six, seven part one and seven part two all have the opportunity to take the top spot as we get into those for very different reasons. But I think trying to dissociate myself as much because I get, look, I went into this movie saying to myself, I don't want to spend the whole recording being the well in the books as I have for every other recording we've done. So I tried really hard to, to try to just enjoy the movie for what it was. And I really liked it. I thought it was, I thought it was really, really good for so many different reasons. There are definitely times where they're a little on the nose with some of their transitions and things like that. And it's a little much for me, but Oh, and the ending is awful. Um, but I was really a fan of this movie. Um, I think it helped me that I haven't read that book in quite some time. So it's not as fresh in my brain. Here's a question for you. I was thinking about this. What, because we've talked about this in the past on this, when we do these rewatches in terms of what the filmmakers were trying to tell you the message of the movie was, what do you think the message of this movie was? I think the overall message in this movie which in my head is like opposite of what the books is trying to point out, which it is. I feel like this movie is like to show how isolated Harry can be, but this book was really more pushing all these friendships he has and that he's not actually isolated, but missed the mark on showing where the anger was boiling up with Dumbledore and that feeling of isolation because he really was surrounded by his group of friends and constantly reminding him that he's not in this alone. Yeah. I, I, as I was watching this movie, thinking about the central theme, I thought a lot about a conversation that we had with Russell on the podcast about the star Wars movies. And he was talking, Russell was talking about 
the sequel trilogy. And so for listeners who aren't familiar, please feel free to listen to all of our incredible Creating Magic episodes because they're all dang good. Um, But particularly um, one of the two or three that we've done with Russell. um, And he was talking about, I I believe he was talking about Ryan Johnson and how Ryan has this trend, you know, signature, whatever you want to call it, where early in the movie, he tells you what the movie's going to be about through a single line of dialogue. And I heard that in this movie for me, um, when Lupin says to Harry, fear makes people do terrible things, Harry. And for me, I think that's what the whole movie was about, right? I think whether you want to talk about kind of what Umbridge's fear, you know, her lack of control, her fear of losing control and image and all that leads her to do throughout the movie. I think if obviously if you want to talk about what Voldemort does as, you know, fear of of death and all that good stuff, certainly Harry making the choice to go to the Department of Mysteries because he fears Sirius is peril. I think that for me, you know, Dumbledore fearing Harry's going to like throughout the movie, I think that's what I kept coming back to. And of course, you can pivot that. And also, I think Dumbledore would probably tell you love makes people do you know terrible things too, right? But for me, that was the core concept for this movie. And I, I'm telling you, I, I was a fan. Uh, I'm actually excited to talk about this one. So, uh, full, <laughs> full transparency. I stopped taking notes about midway through. So at that point, we'll transition from me driving this conversation to you driving the conversation because I just don't remember what comes next after that. But this movie starts out very dark. Both literally, you know, in terms of aesthetically, what you see, it, it's it's probably the darkest start we've got yet. And, the and, and in the last one, in the last one, a guy got eaten by a snake. And as like even specifically, not even the start of the movie, but like the logo before the official start of the movie was noticeably. This is a dark. Time. Yeah, the the music is ominous. It's a it's a cello or a bass or something playing that low kind of vibrato note. It starts off dark. I will say. I'm not criticizing. I just, I did, I didn't understand where that playground was. So you, you, the camera pans in and it comes in over this estate neighborhood for us Americans um, in, you know, um, um, in England, you know, private drive, the whole thing. And this playground is in the middle of nowhere in the middle of a field. And it's not really close to like the neighborhood, to the estate. And then when Harry and Dudley are running away, they also are running like a mile. Like they're running like very far, not in the opposite direction of all the houses. I just didn't get it. I'm not criticizing. I'm not, that doesn't take away from my viewing experience, but I, that made no sense to me. Um, Can we also touch base on Dudley's wardrobe choice? <laughs> yeah. Harry looks like an adult and Dudley looks like a 13 year old. Um, but that, I mean, look, that holds true. I remember because this movie came out in 07, which means it was filmed in like 05, 06. I was roughly, you know, 12 ish around the time of this movie. And that was definitely the trend. It's certainly in the U S I'd imagine in the UK as well of like oversized, uh, you know, hip hop, pop culture inspired outfits. So it's ridiculous. Don't get me wrong, but it holds true. It's not. <laughs> it does. But then there's like all these moments in a Harry and his suit jacket. Yeah, there's sure. Um, if as long as we're talking about wardrobes, um, well, I don't, I don't want to jump yet. We'll come back to wardrobes in a second. Uh, the Dementors show up out of nowhere, might I say, which was another thing I noticed that the filmmakers did throughout the movie. They were a big fan of like the suspenseful reveal, the immediate surprise turn, Right, like thinking about when Harry is at Grimald Place and Hermione hugs him through the door. Thinking about uh, there's a lot of other things I'm slipping my mind now, but there's a lot of moments throughout this movie where defying logic, kind of in in air quotes, they loved the big reveal, kind of right behind you know as you as the camera panned. No, definitely, there's a lot more of that. There's a noticeable but difference between this and yes, I know we have new directors and all that happening regularly. While Danny coughs through this a fit, I should have noted this at the start. I have had a cough, a cough now running on about two and a half, three months, and no one's really sure what's wrong with me. Uh, I've been tested negative for COVID, negative for pneumonia. 
x-rayed you know all the great stuff and they don't know what's wrong with me and for the past week and a half now danny's had a cough too so you know we 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 beg your pardon as as we hack up our lungs through this episode yeah so i thought mrs fig was great me too i was thinking about that i'm like we really haven't heard mention of her whereas in the books we kind of get little i'm not like comparing but like I think her character is great. And she's very different in the movie than the book portrayal. Not dissimilar. I mean, obviously very different characters, very different descriptions and very different presences in the book and the movie, but not dissimilar to how we talked about Rickman and, and book Snape, Uh, very different movie on screen portrayal than what we got in the books, but I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought she both in the scene here going down Privet drive, as well as, later on at the ministry in the in the trial i thought she was just really funny and i loved her little like where she raises her hand and is yeah. like oh wait, guilty not- yeah not yeah that was great um i thought this might have been the best vernon dursley movie and he has a lot of great scenes in both in, in the beginning of all of these movies mm-hmm. like they they know what they had with richard griffiths in terms of his physical humor and his just presence and how he was able to kind of convey hatred, but also in a funny way. Uh, but this might have been the best when he's licking that long spoon, like it, with his face half in the freezer. I don't understand what Petunia is wearing. If you're a middle aged British woman listening to this podcast, please comment on why Aunt Petunia is wearing what seemingly looks like some like negligee lingerie thing on the couch. I get that it's supposed to be like it's summer. She's hot. I get there's a heat wave, but it's also like counter to the character we've been introduced of her being. It looked like she was ready for sexy time while Vernon had a spoon in his mouth halfway in the freezer, was wearing a button up. Yeah, cargoes, not he was on shorts. Disney vacation. Yeah, he looked like he was a dad on vacation. She looked like she was a mom ready to get down. I didn't understand either of it, but I thought that that entire scene was really good with the Dursleys. I thought that was mm-hmm. phenomenal. Um, I thought Vernon taking Dudley to the car, doing that whole pantomiming, you know, he's yeah. not feeling well, and then Fig in the wind. That was all great. I thought that this might be one of the better movie openings they've had um, of the five so far. Mm-hmm. How did you feel? about the broom chase through london oh it's look it's the dumbest thing it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense i suppose the you know the counter argument maybe the producers are making is hopefully you you hearken as they're going through london you hearken back to another time that harry took magic through london and you hear stan shun in your head going muggles don't notice nothing right and so that's what they're hoping you do i guess but yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all from like a logical standpoint why they're just like openly flying brooms through like the Thames and past Parliament and all that good stuff. And then we arrive at Grimald Place. Another strong scene, if you ask me. I th- you know, Sirius appears and he is a uh, 1970s Hollywood actor in his crushed velvet jacket and I also really great. enjoyed the reveal of Grimwald Place before we even enter. Yeah. It's hard for me to remember exactly how I had seen it in my mind's eye when reading the book. I didn't I, see it like that. I didn't see it like that either. That's where I was going. Because I don't remember how I originally like envisioned it. It wasn't that, but I liked that. And the other thing I'll say is you hear that brick like kind of crunching rotating noise all throughout the wizarding world in Orlando. And so mm-hmm. hearing it in the movie is like, Oh, that's nice. Yeah, uh, I think, I don't think I have any initial reactions to like what it was supposed to look like from the books, but I think I associate it more with the later books where they're operating onto the porch step and trying not to be seen. So in my head, it wasn't a scene building. It was kind of like a pocket. Yeah, I don't I don't have strong. Yeah, I don't have a strong recollection, but regardless, I thought I thought it was cool. Um it's very slow. It's like a laborious kind of reveal where like yeah. the houses move very slowly and maybe in my mind I feel like I recall it just being a lot quicker. Like all yeah, of a sudden, I think they like, wanted to kind of give you a like like it was more, like in my mind it was more like Harry looks at and you see 11 and 13 or he blinks and all of a sudden 12 is there like yeah. without anything happen so i mean whatever it, it didn't take away from my viewing experience at all it wasn't no. not a critique um 
Mrs. Weasley thought she nailed Julie Walters, nailed it again. That mm-hmm. look that she gives Harry as he walks up the stairs, that concerned mother look. I have seen that <laughs> so many times in my life. I thought that was like spot on, like conveyed all the emotion you could want it to convey without her having to say much more of anything. Um, yeah, I, 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 then we get to creature. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. I didn't write that down. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's fine. I don't. That's all I really had to say about it. Yeah, like I so I don't need. Like it's not. It's central to the book plot, obviously, uh, for those who read the book. But the way they work around it in the movie is I don't need the whole creature plot line in this movie, right? Like the way. So for people who don't remember from the books or who never read the books, um. Creature is the one who sells out Sirius to, to Voldemort, and Creature is the one who lures Harry into the trap at the Department of Mysteries. And Creature is kind of the 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 uh, fulcrum on which this whole plot kind of twists. So when I saw Creature here, it was it was fine. I, again, I it wouldn't change my viewing of the movie, but Creature not having his plot line definitely lessens just seeing him the once or two, the one or two times you've seen him in the movie earlier. Because he has a really good redemption story through them. Well, that too. That, that as well. But even just order in in its own kind of silo, um, you almost don't need Creature at all because it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't lead to anything. No, but you just kind of need to like have, you just need that little glimpse of seeing who he is for the later things. Right, right. Like they could have... Yeah, like with the way they treated the creature plotline or like they're in this movie, you could have to to convey the darkness and creepiness of this house, you could have just shown a wall of dead house elves. You didn't have to show creature, right? Like it conveys the same emotion if you ask me. Yeah. Um but yeah, so then we get Hermione and Ron in the bedroom. Um yeah, another moment, as we said earlier, where that the 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 filmmakers love that you know Harry opens the door suspenseful and all of a sudden Hermione hits him like a brick you know a bag of bricks. Um, I love the design of the extendable ears. Yeah, those are cool. This is like when I was watching and I'm like, oh, I really actually do like that's not what I pictured them in my head when reading the books. I don't remember exactly what, but I really just like enjoyed like the lowering of the ear and like the response of it. Yeah. Um, hmm, what else do I have here? Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have much else to comment on through there. Next thing I have in my notes, I'm not sure where you're at, is the Ministry of Magic. That's exactly where I jumped to, and I made note of looking at the tiles on the walls. That's the note that I have on my notepad. So again, listeners, um, if you haven't heard our episode where I discussed my experience at Harry Potter in New York, uh, that episode dropped like mid June, if memory serves me correctly, of 2021. So go back and listen to that. Go back and listen to all the episodes while you're at it. Nice little five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts would certainly be appreciated. Um, without spoiling much of anything from the store experience, although at this point it's been open long enough that you really shouldn't be spoiled. Um, there is a Ministry of Magic themed section at Harry Potter New York. Um, and there's the green subway tiles like you get in the ministry scene here in Order of the Phoenix. I was told by one of the amazing uh, sales associates at Harry Potter New York that for the movie, for you know, and you can see the set at Leavesden, at Warner Brothers, Leavesden, out in London, outside of London and Watford. Um, they just used painted wood to, to build that set. Uh, but for Harry Potter New York, I was told that they hand, they bought hand painted tiles shipped uh, imported from Italy um, to recreate that set in the store, but also the, the tiles. And I felt them, and I, I forced Danny to to feel them as well. Um, the paint that they use, the application, I don't look. I'm not a you know uh, je ne suis pas d'artiste. Um, it conveys like a cold feeling, right? So it's it was really cool. Uh, you you can co sign that, right? You were there. I can. It's like noticeably cooler in that area too because of the tiles. Um, yeah, so that was neat. Uh, the trial happens. I you know I don't really have much to say here other than the things I noted from the trial. We talked about Mrs. Fig. She was great. Um, it seems like Dolores Umbridge is the only person in the in the Wizard Agamot who 
customizes her look. Every other person had on the, <laughs> Very the uniform with nothing showing in terms of pendant, in terms of clothing, in terms of anything. Meanwhile, she has like the turtleneck cowl pink. Th- Obviously, they were going for something there. I get that. But it was just a little, it was like, huh, that's odd. It feels like, it feels like they're doing a thing here. And she's like, nah. Um, in the books, it's explained pretty well why Susan Bones is like the one member that kind of speaks up. In the movies, it's not. So, and again, it doesn't take away from my experience at all. But, you know, Fudge is in the big chair. But all of a sudden, Susan Bones is asking questions and then like leading the the body in determining innocence or guilt. And like, there's a little bit of dissonance there. It's like, well, why is she the one being like, shouldn't fudge be doing the anywho? Uh, yeah. This is also the first moment where we see like Dumbledore straight up ignore Harry. Yeah. And so, and we'll see it a few times throughout this, but this is like the first time you see that separation of the Dumbledore Harry relationship directly and not just through words of, Hermione saying that Dumbledore told them not to tell him. What did you think about Michael Gambon's portrayal of Albus Percival Wolfert Brian Dumbledore in this particular movie? I think it's probably his strongest because of the type of portrayal of Dumbledore that he gives it. It because he's like very cold and not connected with Harry in a way and that's kind of the point of Dumbledore in this movie is to be distant and you feel that in this movie but I think he did have some strong parts in this movie as Dumbledore with those characteristics yeah I I liked Michael Gambon's performance in this movie I think it might have been one one of the stronger performances of anyone in the cast in this installment you're exactly right. This movie, Dumbledore, is cold and distant, oftentimes slightly angry, and a lot of times, at least from Harry's perspective, somewhat confused. And that is Michael Gambon's wheelhouse in terms of how he views this character. I was thinking a lot about Gambon's portrayal and why, I mean, other than just calling it bad, saying it's not what Richard Harris or book Dumbledore did. I was thinking a lot about kind of trying to do it, go a little bit deeper than just, you know, bad. For me, it comes down to, I think, Gambin is so good in this movie because he kind of conveys the strength and coldness that Dumbledore oftentimes, strength oftentimes shows, coldness shows throughout Order of Phoenix. But he struggles with layers of nuance, right? So even in this movie, there are moments where if he was just maybe like, for instance, I think about the great hall during the opening, uh, the opening banquet, if he were like 10% softer during that, it would accentuate all the other moments so much better. And that's where he, never mind the fact that he is just in the rest of the movies is a fucking train wreck, but you know, even specifically this movie, which I think he did a good job in this movie. I think he goes from like a very good job to a phenomenal job. If he were able to just kind of, add in a little more nuance and a little more, you know, for every strong moment, soft moment. And I think you see a lot of that where that struggle is in the final conversation of Dumbledore and Harry in this movie. Yeah. Yes. Another great example. Perfect example. Like up to that point, he does so well in the type of things, but in that conversation, you want the more caring and, like he's talking about caring about Harry, but we're not seeing that side. Yeah. Um, but overall, hey, I was I was here for his performance this time. Um, next notes I have is when they are going into the castle. Uh, literally on my page, I have uh, in two separate lines next to each other. I have Cho Chang with a penis drawn next to it. And then Luna Lovegood with like the 100 emoji kind of written next to it. And then in quotes, I hope there's pudding. For two movies straight now, the the filmmakers, different ones too, as we've already noted, have done a phenomenal job at conveying the teenage fuck me angst between Cho and Harry. And it's just outstanding. It's, you know... It, it just, just spot on. And then Luna steals the show. I mean, 
That's uh, a not- great intro to her character that's very her and like very quickly allows you to be like, okay, she's that girl in the in the common room. She's a little weird, she's a little off, but yeah, and, and look, other podcasts who are more professional and more polished than ours have talked about Ivana Lynch's story and how she got in the movie. So we're not going to rehash it here, but, you know, Google it if you haven't heard it. Um, knowing how Ivana Lynch got the role and what it meant to her and seeing her portrayal from from the jump, like, it, it's fun. As we've talked about, some people grew into their characters as the story went from the first scene she's in she she's luna she's the luna you know she's the luna you love and well, it's yeah. it's literally the opposite because book luna grew because of this actor that's true it's that's exact true. opposite is that look at you like, doing some cool like meta analysis there wow that was pretty okay. good the things i noticed in the great hall beyond gambin's lack of nuance here and this of course is a theme throughout this movie you know, the cinematographer, uh, our, our favorite Eastern European, Slavomir, Slav is what I'm going to call him from now on. Um, they were intentional about using a, a filter on the camera and drawing out a ton of color throughout the movie. I thought it was really, really well done. Like, whereas I think, whereas I think in Prisoner, when Quaron did it, it was beautiful. I thought he did it well, but a lot of times it was just drawing away color for drawing away color's sake. In this movie, they did it to really accentuate whether it's light coming in from a corner of the frame or umbrage or or the the orbs, right? Like they were, they were really smart and really intentional about kind of the redefinition of the color tones. So in this scene in the Great Hall, right, they draw away tons of color to accentuate umbrage on the end of the staff table. How again, she doesn't fit in. Um, the other two things I noted here I really loved. As Dumbledore's announcing the the professors, when he announces that Hagrid's on leave, Snape does this little like two beat clap and no one else claps. Like none of the students are clapping, none of the professors. And it's just like this very, I, I don't know if it was intentional, if it was just Alan, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what happened there. But it was just really funny. I don't know. I liked it. Like he does this little kind of like awkward double clap and then Trelawney eating her way through the uh, headmaster speech. I thought was great, too. Like everyone else is sitting there very kind of like, you know, stuffy and and stodgy. And she's just going to town on her dinner. Um, Yeah, two like little cool details. I thought they did well there. Next (laughs) thing I have is Defense Against the Dark Arts class that where you're at. Yes. There's the whole thing with Seamus in the, the dorms, too. Good. It's great. there. We understand people. Some people, like, I understand you need that to be like, oh, yeah, not everyone agrees with Harry. Yeah. Seamus but. is is Wayne Rooney. Look it up. Um, Defense Against Dark Arts class. That happens. Um, I don't really have much to say on the class itself. You know, it it's written pretty well. Or it, it's, it's acted pretty well to what's written in the books. It conveys all the notes you need to about Umbridge's position and where she's coming from and how it's setting up the core tension of the movie. Um, the thing I do want to talk about, though, is the detention. Um, yeah. Because the detention brings us to, I think, the only scene that my mother knows from the entire Harry Potter franchise. Is it because of the cat plates? It's she lit- Anytime I mention <laughs> Harry Potter to her, She'll do, or I mentioned the podcast, or I mentioned going to university. She, literally, she'll just go, oh, "Are you going to see the cat plates?" <laughs> like, that's all she knows. I, she couldn't tell you a single character's name. She couldn't tell you any of the Hogwarts houses. She couldn't tell you the plot of any of these movies. The cat plates, and so that the cat. That's all I got there. I literally wrote in all caps, "cat plates." See, every time I see the cat plates, I think of Amy. Next note I have here is. And I'm quoting, I could watch Ron eat sausage all day. There's just something about the way that Ron eats throughout this series that like just really kind of does it for me. Like it it feels very kind of akin to what I, how I still eat to this day, but how I grew up eating, like he attacks food. So like, here's, here's actually a thing. If you, I only have two references for this. I'm sure there's a lot more in television and movie history, but 
two of my favorite people to watch eat are Ron Weasley and Tony Soprano. If you watch the way they eat, they attack food with like this, like this vigor and almost this like vitriol. Like I'm thinking about Ron eating the chicken wing. I'm thinking about anytime Tony Soprano eats anything in the Sopranos, right? He uses his fork almost as like a weapon. There's something just raw and it, oh, I love it. Well, I find that to be very character driven too, because as a child of multiple children, you got to fight for your food and he's one of seven. You can't wait or you're not getting it. Um, I also have here uh, the McGonagall umbrage on the stairwell. I have one thing before that. Oh, go ahead. I love the little moment of Luna and Harry's conversation with the Thestral. Was that before the stairwell? That was before it. Um, This is where my notes kind of got a little scattershot. So fair enough. I don't understand. I don't understand why she's barefoot. I get it's like she's weird, whatever. But like. You're in the forest. There's like. God knows what on that ground that could pierce your foot and kill you. I will defend her because I was that kid. I never had shoes on. It was very. Were shoes, were shoes a thing when you were growing up? Or did they, did like the local leather smith like make like, like these little like sandal things, like ancient Roman sandals for everyone to wear? I'm just curious. I, 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 I'm using this podcast to learn more about the different cultures of how we grew up and how the 90s are different in the 1900s versus the 1800s. So we got to go on Umbridge on the stairs. Well, no, keep going about the Luna thing. You said you like the scene. Go ahead. I just, I, I like those little, and we've talked about this. I like the little true to life moments. I like seeing Luna and Harry's friendship because like, you see Luna and a lot of times you're just like, yeah, she's the weird girl without friends, but Harry and Luna still have this connection. And it's even in the books where they have these little moments with each other. And I just, I just enjoy them. Yeah. They, they work, they work well together, both in book um, and on screen. Um, Yeah. The McGonagall umbrage thing. That's a classic scene. If you ask me, like if I think about the franchise, like that's a power fight of a scene. That's probably, it's probably one of like the top five kind of like most memorable scenes. I feel like there's probably a bunch more than five and there's probably people like, Oh, I can think of at least 10, but that one sits up there for me in my mind's eye of like, tell me about Harry Potter visually. And I think about them doing the alternating steps. And every time I try to do the accent for McGonagall, it comes out weirdly, uh, like Australian, so I'm not going to do it, but, you know, Dolores, right? Like, I, the whole thing, Even that was Italian. Ta- that was, like, that was kind of a, like, a Mo- Super Mario Italian. I don't know what the hell I'm I doing, don't know but... that was, it was wrong. It's way. me, McGonagall! Given your Italian supposed heritage, do you feel an intimate connection with Super Mario and Luigi? I always like Luigi more than Mario. That says a lot about your personality. The Hogshead? Here's a question for you. When that kid is speaking up and saying, like, Harry just says all this stuff. We don't really know. Um, And Ron has the comeback about why Harry... Um, and Ron goes, why? Because you know who's back, you toss pot. Do you know what a toss pot is? No. I didn't, so I looked it up. <laughs> per the uh, definitions from Oxford Languages Dictionary on, on Google, there are two different definitions. Number one is a stupid or obnoxious person. You. Okay, well, that feels uh, true. Necessary. Number two is a heavy drinker. That said, according to dictionary.com, the difference in definitions is in in literature, toss pot is a habitual drinker of alcohol who's frequently intoxicated. That feels like a very 
redundant sentence. And then in British slang, it's a contemptible person, an idiot or a loser. So it's it, interesting. Uh, Anywho, I looked that up. I don't have much to say on that scene. Thought it was a good scene. Thought it was cool to see the hogshead, however briefly and however limited. This is where my notes end. So I think you got to take over from here on out. Yeah. Well, right before that happened, we had Trelawney being booted from the castle. Here's my comment. Here's my Mm -hmm. comment on that. Only comment I have on that. Why were the castle doors closed? How did they get out? Because when Dumbledore appears, the castle doors open super dramatically. And obviously they're doing it for dramatic content. But just remove the dramatic plot line out of it. How are the castle doors closed? How do all the students get out there? Doesn't they could have just as easily had Dumbledore like push through the crowd or like the students kind of form a cut like a like a, yeah. you know like a parting of the sea. I understand where they were going, but it doesn't make it makes zero sense to me. Because like what those massive ass castle doors open and close when one person wants to that doesn't make any sense. No. Absolutely not, because the doors don't close when Dumbledore walks out into the courtyard. They stay open. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyhow, that was my only comment on that entire scene. The scene was fine. You know what? It shows McGonagall hugging Trelawney. You know, shows how much she cares about Hogwarts and the whole thing. Because as you know, or that she, she hates Umbridge so much. Well, right, right. To teach that, that, that right. crazy. It, it shows. You know, it shows that. Again, I noted here how muted the color tones are. If you look at the robes, all the students are wearing. The, the neckline, right, of those robes has the house colors on them. And you can see how deeply muted the color is because it's, you know. Uh, anyhow, I noticed that. But, um, yeah, that scene happened. Anything you, else you want to say? No, not on that one. Cool. What's next? I jumped to one of my favorite characters that I loved seeing in this movie because he's really grown into himself this movie. Neville finding the room of requirement. Yeah. I, (laughs) I, I don't, again, I get, but I don't like that whole montage of scenes of Filch and Malfoy and all them. That is the reason I hate this movie. It just doesn't make any sense. It bothers me so much. I was like, I was fine with Neville finding the room of requirement. I'm fine with that change. I was fine with like all the little things happening within the room requirement, but the whole filch and the inquisitional squad that just bothers me so much. Like when they're like stalking Luna as she skips down the hall, it just annoys me. Yeah. I Like that actually ruins the movie for me. Well, that it, montage well, of scenes. Because in the books, because again, you're able to have a lot more of that dialogue and inner monologue you know that the room of requirement, you can be hyper-specific with how you mentally set the room up, right? So you can say, I need a room that even if they're staring at it, they won't be able to find or enter, right? You don't get that in the movie. You just get Hermione's thing about the come and go room, blah, 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 right? So there there was something to be said in the... Again, I'm trying really hard not to be like the in the books guy, but for this scene, I think it's a, it's a fair conversation to have. A, yeah. Right. In the books, all the students go around with this elevated confidence and happiness, knowing that they're blatantly defying the, you know, Umbridge's rule. And that this isn't but, a room that they found that everyone knows about. Well, right, but, the, but they're not doing it with complete disregard for discretion. Right. Whereas in the movie, the way that this whole scene is set up, it's like, oh, yeah, she knows that we're doing it. Everyone knows that we're doing this. But. They can't get, you know, haha, sucks to be them. I didn't love that. Like that, that didn't work for me as much. I mean, I like. And then I mean, they look, put a uh, hole David, in the door. Yeah, you know, David Bradley is a great actor. Um, like I love seeing him sit there with his thermos and his like soccer chair, right? And like, like I, I liked that, but the the conception of the scene didn't work for me. Yeah, that is my biggest issue of this movie is that whole sequence yeah um you also don't get in the movie the whole enchanted parchment sign up sheet the whole uh and then it's but then it's mentioned once they're caught right it's mentioned once they're caught that they signed up but 
they change the whole conception of that to be mm-hmm. the veritaserum usage in the tea and the person, but which that doesn't make any sense because the the way that when you see Umbridge inviting all the students in for tea and all that stuff, my interpretation was she's using the truth serum on every single person. Mm-hmm. Um, but. So did that just mean that Cho was the first one from the DA that she spoke with? Because, like, if she's using the truth serum, truth's going to come out whether you want to tell her or not. So, like, Harry gets all pissy, which they all kind of get pissy with Cho. But it could have just as easily been fucking Harry who told her. Well, if Harry well that's the, the thing is, though, like, if you're, like, if you're a smart person who's using Verity Serum on every student and you're looking for the specific club that you know is full of a bunch of Gryffindors, why are you starting with the Ravenclaw trick? Yeah. It's, it's, and yeah. So again, it didn't impact my viewing of the movie, but one of those things, where that's an odd change to make. Cause you, cause either way you don't really explain it. So if you know, you should have just spent the extra five seconds to explain it and then done it right. So this is where my notes stopped for a little bit. They did pick back up, but I was making dinner, so my notes jumped to <laughs> going to the um, department of mystery. Well, there's got to be stuff before that. Hang there on. is. There is. Before um, that, you get. Grop. We have your favorite character Grop. Uh, favorite CGI happening. It's just so bad. I. I just don't, I don't get it. Again, again, this is where I keep talking about, you know, again, we talked about this with some of the Star Wars episodes too, where it's like the jump in technology in Star Wars is A, so deeply impressive, but the flip side of that is I'm not as bothered by the, the original trilogy's technology or lack thereof because it was so long ago in the past, right? It was in the late 70s, early 80s. Whereas this entire movie franchise happens in a vacuum between 2001 and 2011. And like, let's be clear in 2001, the tech was still pretty good, but especially by 2007, when they're making this movie, the tech is really, really damn good. Like when did Avatar come out? Google that. Googling. So I'm like, I was like thinking in my head, I'm like, did pirates use it? If that was the number one grossing, did they have any CGI? Like- yes. All the boats. Pirates, they have freaking Bill Nye, whatever. Bill Nye, however you pronounce his name, as... Uh, uh, not the science guy? No, not the science guy. As Davy Jones, who has, like, squid tentacle head. Avatar was t- only two years later. All right, so my point, yeah, the technology was quite clearly contemporaneously good enough to where it, it does, like, crops on a major character, like, whatever, but, like, it stands out how bad it is. Yeah. Um, so there was that. It's cute when he's ringing the little bike bell. Um, you then get, um, Harry in the classroom where he's getting tortured or about to get tortured, I suppose. Well, I get the we-, we skipped the Weasley scene altogether when the Weasleys have their grand exit. Um, another iconic scene, another one of the most iconic kind of scenes to come out of the franchise, both the music, the visuals, the whole thing. Um, We saw demonstrated at the 2018 celebration, Harry Potter in uh, Florida, how all of the proclamations fell um, the educational decrees, how they fell off the walls, off their hooks. That was, that was cool. I liked the little gag of, Filch with his ladder, kind of almost killing students left and right. Um, yeah. I really was waiting for a give her hell peeps. <laughs> That's why. Yeah, that well, yeah. Um, I guess before we get to the department, it's worth yeah, this. The actual, like, Weasley Christmas. Oh, well, that too. Um, I forgot about that. Yeah, Arthur gets attacked. But- Hermione and Harry, Harry is in the classroom and, and, you know, the minister doesn't, what he doesn't know won't hurt him or whatever. Then Hermione and Harry lead Umbridge. She gets carried away by the centaurs. 
uh, the squad shows up on that bridge, which I still can't tell you where exactly that bridge is placed in relative to the rest of the castle, but it's fine. Um, fly, of course. Yeah. Another great Luna scene, uh, really great Ron scene too, where he's like, maybe you don't have to go at it alone. Like that was really good. I thought, um, yeah. So they fly, they go to the ministry, they run, they run, they run. Can I add something on this? Just because we've recently learned that the fear factor section is close, closing. Wouldn't it be fun to have like a, even though there's already a race through like Jimmy Fallon, but like a race through the ministry of magic ride. Yeah. As long as it's better than the, well, yeah, it has New to York. be better than like, Jimmy um, Fallon. but like, I was like thinking about that when they were like running through everything and like all the things fall and the dementors chase. I'm like, this would make a fun ride. Well, let's take a sidebar pause here from the movie just to quickly talk about that. So for listeners who aren't aware, uh, universal recently confirmed that the fear factor live staging area and and production at universal orlando is going to be permanently closed um if you pull up a map of universal studios in orlando you'll see that fear factor live backs up to a portion of the wizarding world of harry potter the diagon alley section specifically there is a um I don't know whatever they want to call it, a stage door. There's there's a point of connectivity that's really natural right from the Wizarding World into the Fear Factor Live area. And it and it's in kind of the open area of Diagon Alley. It's not like right in the middle of like one of the rides. Like it's not in the middle of the restaurant. Like it would be very easy to knock down a piece of Diagon Alley, open it up and connect it in. So it is widely rumored, and at this point, I have to believe true that whenever they get around to retheming Fear Factor Live and rebuilding there, it's going to be Harry Potter themed. My question for you, Danny, is I guess A, a couple of different questions. A, do you think it will be a Harry Potter themed thing or a Fantastic Beast themed thing? B, is do you think it is going to be solely a ride or do you think it's going to be another kind of so like i guess the comparison points do you think it's going to be solely a ride like hag ride or do you think it's going to be an area that may contain a ride not dissimilar to hogsmeade or diagon alley and then i guess finally see irrespective of all that what do you hope it's going to be Well, with A, I would think, unless it's areas that overlap with Fantastic Beast, I think it's going to be more Harry Potter because with Epic Universe, I think they'll pull Fantastic Beast in there because it is called the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios. So I would think they would keep that in and try to loop Fantastic Beast in with the new park because we also have new movies coming out that can expand that section or there'll be some overlap, like maybe the ministry and such. Um, I would hope that it is a both a ride and an extension of the land. I would really love like a night bus roller coaster of some sort. Like not what the tram ride like Kong and Fast and Furious, not that. I want like a coaster that is like the night bus. Yeah. You know, I don't I, know what that looks like, but I, I would like a more of a thrill ride. Well, it's funny. I hadn't so to to the Fantastic Beasts Harry Potter question. I hadn't thought about it through the lens of Epic Universe. I had thought about it more through just business strategy. And I guess there's two sides of that argument. Side A is you already have, with very heavy air quotes, because as you well know, you can never have enough Harry Potter in our mind. But from a business perspective, you already have enough Harry Potter in the parks, right? And so you have this hot branch, well, hot being a, you have this well-funded well-publicized franchise in fantastic beasts why not put in something right it makes sense to do that 
the other side of the coin is this third movie by all reports is going to be the fulcrum on which the rest of the series hinges. And if it doesn't go well, they may not make more. So then do you really want to be putting fantastic beast stuff when you know? So I tend to agree that I think it's going to be Potter related, not for the same reasons you shared, but I agree in the end result that I think it's going to be Potter related. I was envisioning agree some extension of what I was thinking, if anything would be cool, would be a fully blown out Nocturne Alley. Like not just that little corner they give us, mm-hmm. like, like do it bigger. Cause Universal is, you know, unlike Disney, which makes sense. Universal is more than happy to lean into the dark. Like they're not scared of, of, of removing the fun, optimistic, happy family vibe. Right. And so I think Nocturne Alley would be great. I think people would live for it. I think you could provide a ton of great new scening and staging for them as, you know, entertainers. I think that would be a piece of it, you know, because you can build out that back corner a little bit. You can, but a lot of this is from the movies and we don't get a lot of Nocturne in the movies. Well, yeah, but but they have the one corner already, which means that A, they weren't afraid to go there to some extent. B, people who go to universal are already familiar with the concept. So yeah. just, you know, just, I think you could blow that out. I think you also could just make that whole diagon out that whole butterbeer section a lot bigger and throw in some other storefronts, whatever. But the, the ride that I was thinking of, I think the night bus, by the way, makes a ton of sense. I think that would, because they already have the night bus. I think that would be incredible. I think that would be so amazingly cool. Now that you say it, that might be my favorite idea. I was always thinking some sort of ministry thing because the location with Diagon Alley, you're yeah, in London. I, it makes... I'm, I'm aiming more ministry. I I, I love a night bus ride, yeah, but I, I think because of the location, it makes more sense to go ministry because they're going to want to stay. They're very specific of staying Hogwarts Hogsmeade on this yeah. side, Diagon Alley on this side, and we know the ministry is part of Diagon, right? So and it would so, make more sense. You know, they they could do. And you know, a whole not dissimilar to escape. I mean, the, the conception of the ride, be the, the the ride vehicle, I couldn't tell you, but similar to Escape from Green Gods, they could have multiple set scenes, whether it's a coaster or a or a a, a forbidden journey thing, it doesn't matter. But you know, they could have set scenes where you're in the courtrooms and you're with the mentors. You're in the main area and you're dueling Voldemort and Bellatrix. So I think like trying to get the prophecy, like. Just watching that whole scene of all the movement, yeah. um, that's kind of what popped in my head. But you know, that type of ride. I mean, they 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 only have in terms of thrill coaster, they only have rip ride on that side. And so they could really and 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 look, you know, nostalgic UOAPs aside, eventually I think you have to get rid of um Men in Black, you have to get rid of Simpsons. Yeah, I'm not saying soon, but you know, yeah, within the next decade. And so putting a massive thrill coaster that's bright purple back there could really re-anchor that back corner of studios really, really well. Because it's really a walkthrough corner. Wow. It's not even a walkthrough corner. I don't no, because you can skip there. it easily. Yeah, you can skip the whole you thing. You only pass that corner if you're going to Men in Black. And you could skip the oh wow. They could put a whole restaurant. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of space back there. There's mm-hmm. that's probably the on studio side. That is probably the most property bound area that they have to expand. Yeah. Wow. Anywho, okay, let's get back to the movie. But that's got my that, that's got my attention. Um, yeah. So prophecy stuff. Lucius shows up. Um, I will say, loved. I loved everything about the ministry scene, the whole set of scenes, up until they started fighting the Death Eaters, both in the Hall of Prophecy as well as in the, the Veil Room. Because I thought Lucius's monologue was great. I thought Bellatrix was spot on. I thought them running through, before they got to Lucius, them running through the ministry and walking mm-hmm. through all the, the lines of prophecy was great. And then they start fighting, and it's just this weird, like, they turn a corner, and Lucius shows up, puts his hand out, and they turn away. And then this other Death Eater, like, pokes Luna in the face, and she falls to the ground. 
They just only use stupefy like a thousand and a half times until Ginny remembers that they know one other spell and she uses reducto. I didn't like the actual fighting. Um, yeah, it's a it's a hard fighting scene as well as knowing that like these are death theaters who have been doing this for decades. Yeah. Versus at the oldest fifth years. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. A hundred percent. Fifth and fourth years. Yeah. Because of Ginny and Luna. Yeah. Agreed. Like it makes sense. They're only using a few spells because that's all they got on their belt. Well, they got more than that. They, Harry's they do, that. but Harry's like, got expel the arm. Like it was just, and I'm with you. I'm with you. Your 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 theory is correct. Um then they're in the uh the veil room, and Lucius does the you know the cane walk. Sirius shows up. They have those really weird, like super superhero y kind of arrivals where it's like it's like transportation, it's like Star Trek transporting down, not operating. If you say and so, I can't. Some are white, some are like well, yeah, the the the, the, the trail thing doesn't make any sense where they have yeah. the different colors. Um but yeah, like in my mind in the books, especially like if you think about just human nature. If you and I were fighting, right, and all of a sudden you just apparated in, well, no, you wouldn't. Are you kidding me? I'm taller. I'm stronger. I'm faster. You're old. Um, if you just app- taller, that's all if I'm you, giving you. If you apparated in, I wouldn't wait for you to make some triumphant arrival before I started casting spells at you. Like uh, Tonks shows up. And does that weird, like, super hyper look around thing. And Kingsley shows up and is, like, resplendent. And it's like this, like, oh, look, the Superman is here. But no, like, Bellatrix is going to be casting spells. Like, you're not waiting for them to be like, hello, I am here. It is time for us to duel. Um, yeah, this is not a formal duel. This is life and death. I'm not going to comment, as we have before, on the serious death with the green light, red light, that whole thing. The thing I will comment on is in the movie, he is very clearly hit with Vada Kedavra. He's hit with the killing spell. After he's hit, his eyes still move around and he has bodily function, which is not at all what the killing curse does. Mm-hmm. At all. So like, that's, that's the only thing I'm going to say about all that is that didn't sit with me. Is like That doesn't make any sense. No, there's just a lot of things that didn't make sense. Um, then I can't serious back. I can't serious back. You're gonna get me. Uh, that whole chase scene happens. No one thinks to run after Harry, even though Lupin's holding him back. Lupin doesn't be like, "Hey, stupefy. Hey, Petrificus Totalis. Hey, let me follow you." None of that. Um, and then, and this. Actually, I know they both have super white faces, and so, and they're kind of ghost like, so maybe it's an easy comparison. But this movie cemented for me that Voldemort is the ultimate. If, if Harry Potter were a series of Broadway plays, the role of Voldemort is the ultimate Phantom of the Opera role because you are not, you, know, you, you are like the co leading character in this, in this musical. You are not the character who is on stage for the most amount of time. And you are not a character um, who has a ton of breadth in terms of what you portray when you are on stage. But when you're there, you have to hit every note pitch perfect. And Ray Fine shows up again and just nails it. Absolutely nails it. Like from start to finish, his like three minutes on screen in this movie are pitch perfect. No, I I agree with that. Definitely. Like you can't in that role, you can't have a weak performance. The fight scene. The Dumbledore Baltimore fight scene is pretty epic. It's good. It's good. I would have loved. It's the biggest fight scene we've really seen in the whole series. I would have loved to have been in the audio booth when Ray Fiennes had to make all those grunts and noises. Where he's like, "Ah!" and he's trying to like push the spell towards Harry. Like that was like I would have enjoyed just the outtakes on that. Yeah, there's just a lot of great stuff happening, right? Because it's no longer just jet of indiscriminate jet of light that has no purpose. 
right? It's like, an actual, we are battling. Like, like Voldemort, when he casts that whole kind of just like darkness at Dumbledore, and I think that like the specks of black, mm-hmm. it's like just, it just looks like evil incarnate, right? Like, I love that. You know, I don't wholly understand the Dumbledore ball of water, nor do I understand for that matter. This is where you have debates about wand lore and all that stuff. In Goblet of Fire, when Harry is fighting the dragon and he's trying to get the golden egg and he casts Accio Firebolt, he just throws his wand up his Accio and puts his wand down and runs. Which then implies that you don't have to maintain kind of the wand position for the duration of the spell. When Voldemort puts his hands up to do the shattered glass thing and he has his arms crossed over his head, wand pointed down, his arms are up the entire time as that happens. Which is, if you, if, if you really want to get nuanced into the weeds about casting of spells and the appropriate want, whatever, that contradicts what we already saw on screen to be true, right? Which is that you yeah. don't need to maintain the gesture for the entirety of the act. Um, so I thought that was something I just thought about. I'm not really sure why, but that that kind of stood out for me. Um, but yeah, it was a good fight scene. Harry and his snake like. Oh, I hated that. So the only thing I hated about it, well, the only thing I hated on that, all of the scenes inside of his head, I'm fine with him writhing on the ground, dry humping the ground, the the Voldemort voice, like, kill me, you know, that whole thing. But when you see Voldemort in his head, like doing that, that was just like so bizarre. I hated that. I couldn't stand that. That was weird, weird beyond weird. I really did like when Harry finally talks back and like is starting to reclaim himself, Mm -hmm. that look that Gambin gives him where it's almost this like astonished kind of look. It's like very fleeting, but it's like this close up side profile of Dumbledore's face, right? As Harry is starting to repel out the bad memories and show all the ones of love. It's like, I feel bad for you. There's this flat quick flash of Dumbledore's face as he realizes that Harry is going to be able to push him out. And it conveys so much good. Like it, to me, it was like, oh, like Dumbledore was like a star, like, oh, like Harry can do it. Like it, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. My proverbial hat is off to you, Michael Gambon. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the last thing I'll say about all of this, and that's really all I have to say about the movie, I suppose. When Fudge says he's back, in the books we know this, in the movies we don't, but didn't Voldemort, didn't the physical incarnation of Voldemort we see now, not at all look like the Voldemort that people would have remembered from back in the day. So when Fudge sees this like six foot four snake, like pale white bald dude and says, he's back. How does he know that's Voldemort? Dumbledore has been yelling. He's back. And well, that, but that could have been anyone. Yeah. I have F- I like don't F- know. Fudge's counter argument could have been, well, I don't know that's Voldemort. That could have yeah. been any dude who broke into the ministry. Yeah. Like that, you know, that's where I was like, well, he has no reason. It's not, it's like if I show up now to go see my old high school teachers, they're going to remember me as still a fairly old, semi balding looking kid, but someone who had hair and was younger and all that versus now where I'm, you know, as bald as the day is long. You can't expect me to recognize you immediately now because my memory of you from 10, 15 years ago is a drastically different looking person. What were your favorite scenes of this movie? Not scenes. You only allowed one. What was your favorite scene? Jeez. it's a good question. Or which one sticks out the most to you that you enjoy? It's not necessarily favorite. I hate the word favorite sometimes. Well, fewer scenes stood out in this movie because unlike the past ones where I thought a lot of the movie was bad, so the couple of good ones really stood out, I thought this movie was good. I don't know. You sound like me right now. What is going on? Well, because there's not that many that stand out. Like, I thought there was a lot of good stuff, but, like, there wasn't one thing where I was like, oh, my goodness, this is the... I guess the two that I, you know, I guess the one. The one that really, I I suppose, stood out in terms of the impact it's had, the Weasley twins uh, escaping Hogwarts. Because that scene has been bastardized and used at at the Wizarding World. That music is, like, probably other than Hedwig's theme, the most recognizable music from 
the Harry Potter scene, like that scene itself probably has the biggest impact on the Harry Potter fan culture beyond the seven, the eight movies. So I'm going with that. What about you? McGonagall Umbridge scene. It's just such a strong scene. And it really just kind of shows you what's going on when McGonagall takes that step down. What was the most surprising thing for you during this movie? How much I enjoyed this movie. I really didn't think I was going to enjoy this one as much as I did. Yeah, I think that's it. Like, I enjoyed it as a whole, whereas the last few, I was just, they felt more of a struggle to get through. What about you? The continuity of the movie, like the consistency of it all. Like, yeah, like, like I was just saying, in the past movies, it was very easy to identify what was really good because it deeply contrasted against the rest of the movie, which was really bad. This movie, I wasn't surprised that I liked this movie because I remembered having good feelings about it. So it's definitely not surprised that I enjoyed it, but surprised that the whole thing was just pretty good. It was just, it was a good movie. Your, who, who won the movie for you? Umbridge. I hate her character, but she does such a freaking good job in this movie. The portrayal of that character is just so well done. I'm also going to give an honorable mention to Kingsley just because I enjoy him. Yeah, Imelda Staunton does a phenomenal job. I thought the trio, again, put in a real solid effort. Definitely. Uh, like I have, I have no complaints about any of their portrayals. Yeah, I just, with Umbridge, you know, we only are introduced to her in this movie, and right out of the gate, she is, you hate her. I thought Ray Fiennes, again, was mm-hmm. insanely good as Voldemort. Helena Bottom Carter haunts my dreams and my nightmares <laughs> as Bellatrix. Who won? Well, it also does really good, but she just, she's not like, uh, she is, all her little moments are great, but she's, she's like a tertiary character still. I'm honestly going to say David Yates won this movie because coming off of Goblet of Fire, which, is quite possibly one of the worst movies ever produced in the history of movie production. You're now, what, they've had Columbus, Quaron, and Newell. You're now the fourth director in five movies. There's a lot of pressure, I think, on you to establish your own POV as a director, to have it be unique and your own take, but also fit within the world. But the other thing is, again, the world, There's you're the fourth director in five movies. The world has shifted a ton. So there's a lot of weird dynamics, right? Then Steve Cloves isn't writing this. So there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of kind of shifting kind of floor tiles underneath his feet as he directs this movie. And of course, and also David, even just as simple as the age of the characters that they're developing in a very different way now. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different dynamics that I think go into this movie david yates you know went on to direct the rest of the harry potter movies and the franchise and yeah i i thought i thought you know the majority of directorial choices were really really well done so i'm gonna say david yates i think that that's my winner what are your impressions of movie six what are my impressions or what are your thoughts before watching? What are you expecting? Well, we're back to awful Michael Gambon. Um, she was very pretty, the girl. Do as I say, Harry. Uh, it's not going to be. That's that's going to be ugly. That's going to be really, really bad. Um, not looking forward to that at all. Um interesting because as listeners know i think about these movies a lot through their color palette five they went for a semi-monochromatic very uh tinted and muted look but it was oftentimes through like a bluish lens my recollection of Half Blood Prince is not is that it still is very monochromatic and very dark and very muted, but not blue. I remember it being a lot more gray green, I guess, like almost like an olive kind of muted kind of color. 
I don't know why that's what's standing out in my head, <laughs> but that's what I'm expecting is bad Michael Gambin and a whole different monochromatic look. So that's what I've got to look forward to. What about you? I'm excited for Tom Felton's performance in movie six. Yeah, he doesn't do much in this movie, does he? No, we barely see him. And honestly, comparatively, we this is the movie where we really start to see Draco and we get to kind of know his story a little bit more behind this movie. So I'm excited to see that. I will say for all the listeners out there who are looking for something to do as you're listening to the wrap up of this episode, we have 35 ratings on Apple Podcasts. I don't know who the hell gave us a two star. Whoever you are. Go seek therapy or something. Our last review that we got was in November of 2020. So we're due for a good review. So if you're out there and you appreciate all of our musings, I encourage you to go to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. And it doesn't do any. I mean, I'm sure it does something in terms of the algorithm and all that, but we don't really care about that. We're not here for that. It does something insofar as Danny works very hard for this podcast and I work medium for this podcast and it would just be nice to feel some sense of appreciation for that which we do so that's all i got danny is that all you got that's all i got all right i'm hitting end goodbye bye